Since God created time, since God created time, in the beginning, God, from the first nanosecond of history of the world, all the way through to October the 26th, 2019, 30 years of that period, a little slice of it, from A.D. 33 to A.D. 64. That little slice of all of history is the most important period of time ever. What is that slice? The story is told in the book of Acts. Acts, many Bibles give it the title of Acts of the Holy Spirit. What happened? Jesus, born, lived, taught, died, was resurrected, ascended, and then he tells them to take a time out, wait, wait, wait. And 70, 120 of them waited in that upper room day after day after day. And Jesus said, wait until power comes. You know anything about the Bible? We know the Holy Spirit came. Peter preached the sermon at Pentecost. 3,000 people became believers, virtually all Jews. A few weeks later, he proclaimed again in the temple area, 5,000 believers came to Christ. And what was going on? The Holy Spirit had come into the world. The Holy Spirit had come. God the Father, God the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. In my life, the Holy Spirit has been like a a beat of a drum. It started, I guess, when I was about 11, when I understood as best I could what it meant to be a Christian. When I was 18, an atheist challenged my faith. It became personal and real, changed my life, and the Holy Spirit, the drum, got a little louder, a little louder. There have been times in my life when the Holy Spirit has been very quiet, when I've wandered away in my mind, in my choices. It's been there. It's never left. Sometime I didn't even hardly hear it, but it was there. But then in times of a fresh breath from heaven, the Holy Spirit picked back up. In times of crisis, it got louder. In times of fear, that Holy Spirit got louder and louder in me. Because the Holy Spirit if it's represented by the drumbeat, the Holy Spirit in your life and in my life represents him who is the drummer, and that's Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. The beat of the drum of the Spirit in every person who knows Christ receives him as Lord and Savior in their life. The Holy Spirit's purpose is for us to honor and exalt the drummer who is the Lord Jesus himself. The Holy Spirit came. The church was founded. All Jews virtually. We have already walked through several personalities in the book of Acts. And we've got all the way to the 
transitional moment in the life of the church. We've walked all the way to Acts chapter number 6. And here we're introduced to a deacon of all things on the planet, not an apostle, not someone who had official positions known by people, a deacon, a servant of the church. And it says in Acts chapter 6, verse 5, the statement found approval with the whole congregation, the elected deacons, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, then jump down to verse 8. It says, and Stephen, full of grace and power. All of a sudden, we've got somebody in the church who has faith, full of faith. We have someone in the church who is now full of the Holy Spirit. We have someone who now has grace, charis, gifts, and now someone who has power, power. What do you do with power? Full of faith, filled with the Holy Spirit, grace, the gifts of God in your life and my life of working and the results is power. Why do we need power? What do you do with power? What is the purpose from power? Let's go back to Acts chapter number one. We look at the great commission, we call it, the commission Jesus gave to all Christians. Acts 1 verse 8 says, Jesus speaking, but you will receive power, birthday of the church, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, it's come upon the church, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the uttermost part of the world. The purpose of being filled with the Holy Spirit is to be a witness. Isn't that something? Who would have guessed? What are we to witness about? We're to witness about what God has done for us in Jesus Christ and what God continues to do for you and for me in Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit. We're to be witnesses. And then we see Stephen gets it. He's full of power. Go back, if you would, to our passage in Acts chapter number Six. It says in verse 7, and the word of, the, of God kept spreading, and the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. How did that happen? Priests. Well, I looked at that and I said, my goodness, these are the priests who served there in the temple. Man, they were Sadducees, didn't believe in the resurrection. They were more politicians than they were religious people. Priests were coming to believe. What was it that led these Jewish priests? Scholars, no doubt. You know what I think it was? I think it goes back not to the crucifixion of Jesus. Can you imagine the priests there in the temple? Everything grew black in the sky. Then all of a sudden, the veil of the temple, which was what, seven, eight, ten stories high, was torn from the top to the bottom, not from the bottom to the top. And those priests there witnessed that or observed that and said, how could this happen? It's, it's impossible. It, it cannot take place. And now for the first time, most of these priests, only one priest went in, remember, once a year in the Holy of Holies. Now the Holy of Holies, they could see in the Holy of Holies. And they looked in, and they saw the ark, and they saw the cherubim, and they knew what was in the ark. The veil was torn. It was a new day, a new beginning, and those priests began to put together the prophecies of the, of the Old Testament. They began to put, put together what happened on Calvary. They began to understand, and they became believers in the early church. Priests, numbers of priests. Got it? It's, it's really something. Now, look at the rest of the passage. It says, and Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great 
wonders and signs among the people. For, verse 9, but some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. But they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. We see here Stephen, now he has the power of God, now he is witnessing in the synagogue. Now, ladies and gentlemen, to understand the New Testament, you've got to get one thing clear that most of us are confused about. The early church was primarily composed of Jews. 99.9% .9 all were Jews. And now time has passed and the early church still was primarily composed of Jews who come to receive Jesus as Messiah. They still met in the synagogues. They still were part of Judaism. They were a sect, a group within synagogues. And they had all kinds of synagogues, and the synagogue of freed men that's mentioned here, they mentioned the kind of people that came from the Hellenistic world. Stay with me. They, they were Greek-speaking Jews who'd come back to Jerusalem. They were Hellenistic Jews, and because perhaps they didn't understand Aramaic or Hebrew, they had their own synagogue synagogue of free men. And you see the list of the different nations these Jews had come from, and they made up the synagogue of freed men. They were relatively new in Jerusalem. And it is natural that Stephen would be a part of this group. And guess who in all probability went to that same synagogue? A young Pharisee, brilliant rabbi named Saul. That's supposition. Cilicia is mentioned. That is where Stephen is from. That is where Saul is from. So you would guess that Saul was a part of the same synagogue Stephen was in. And now Stephen is filled with power witnessing, telling about what Christ is doing in his life, how he received Christ. And he's meeting all of their arguments, all their questions, all their confusion, head on with brilliance. And with wisdom, why not? He was full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit, full of grace, full of power. Anybody want to compete with that kind of person? And so he was winning all the day. And so I think, once again, I believe it was Saul. Could have been someone else. They accused him of blasphemy. What's well, a good word? It's, you know, blasphemy sounds like what it is. Blasphemy. It's like the word hippopotamus, sounds like hippopotamus. Yeah. Yeah. These are words. And so they accused him. And then we see his witness here in the synagogue with power. And then we see the whole setting moves. They take Stephen and they take him before the council, which is the Supreme Court. <laughs> they didn't work up to the Supreme Court. They went right into the Sanhedrin, the same Supreme Court that had said to Jesus, he's worthy of death and led to his crucifixion. The same Supreme Court. And now we have Stephen taken before them. And now we see him witnessing not only the synagogue, but he's with the Supreme Court. Verse 12, chapter 6 of Acts. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came up to him and dragged him away, it took him before the council, the Supreme Court. And they put forward false witnesses, listen carefully, who said, this man incessantly, incessantly speaks about the holy place and the law. In other words, he's always demeaning the temple, and he's always demeaning the law of Moses. Verse 14. For we have heard him say, this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed out down to us. And therefore they fixed their gaze on him, 
all who were sitting in the council, the Supreme Court, saw Stephen's face like the face of an angel. Is that something? I've read that so many times, I get excited every time I read it. He's before the Supreme Court of the land. Those 70 rabbis and priests and scholars, and they're the highest place of judicial importance. And he stands up before them, and they accuse him of two things. They say, you're trying to change the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, the, the Decalogue. My goodness, he, he's slandering how Moses has taught us to worship. And on top of that, he is demeaning the temple itself. But they couldn't take their eyes off of him because his face shone like the face of an angel. Oh, he is demeaning Moses. When is the last time in Jewish history you saw a face shine like an angel? You'll make a wild guess. Moses, when he came down from Sinai, that's when it was. And man, his face was shining. And I can, be, I can assure you that this Sanhedrin didn't know how to handle that because they had made these charges. And then this sounds familiar too. Remember Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? And then look at chapter 7, verse 1. The high priest said, are these things so? He said, are you telling the truth? They said, look, you're slandering the temple. You're slandering Moses but his face was shining. And then he gives a defense. I hate to discourage you, but it's the longest sermon in the book of Acts. I mean, if you read it, it's just, woo. I mean, it's, you read all the commentaries, they don't know what he's saying. It's just, but what he does, Stephen then, before these religious authorities, he goes all the way through the history of the Jews. And every one of them knew it. Every one of them knew it. But he goes back and he specifically addressed, if you read it ever so carefully, ever so carefully, the charges that are made against him. In one sense, the charges they made are absolutely accurate. What was he doing? Christianity was destroying the whole ream and understanding and background and theology of Judaism. Absolutely. It was wiping out everything they knew about God, about worship. It's true. But they didn't understand where he was coming from. So he went through all of their history, highlighting not just two things, but three, as one scholar said, holy cows of Judaism. What was the holy cows? The first cow was land, L-A-N-D. It was land. Boy, the land. We, 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 you have to be in the holy land before you can really worship. And, and then he talked about the law. Oh, you have to obey the law if you're going to be right with God. And then if you're really going to worship, you'd better go to the temple. It's a holy place. Why we've got God captured in the temple. He's the holy of holies. And we got him in a box in there. And he goes and attacks all these basic sacred cows. And I won't go through all of it because we need a nap before the morning time comes. But look, look at the first one. He attacks the law, his defense. He says, verse 2, chapter 7, And hear me, brethren and fathers, respectful, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. In other words, he say, God appeared to Abraham. He wasn't in the Holy Land. When God said, you get up and go, he wasn't there. He didn't leave Ur the Chaldees. He went to Haran. Where is that? That's not in the Holy Land. He said, being in the Holy Land doesn't make you godly and isn't a way in which you know I'm right with God. I'm in your land. He said, oh, no, that's not the answer. And he goes on and dresses it on and on and on. And then he picks it up again in verse 30, still the same chapter. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. Now he says God appeared to Moses. 
on Mount Sinai. Where's Sinai? It's not the Holy Land. Where was the burning bush? It's not in the Holy Land. He's saying, God, you see what's trying to happen? You'll see it in a minute. God is trying to bring those Jews out of their little land, their little bias, their little prejudice, their little prudentialism. And now Stephen is just coming right at them. By the way, if you preach like a prophet, you're going to die like a prophet. No, don't ever forget that. So this is what he's doing. He talks about the land. And then he comes and moves on, and he talks then. Look at verse um, 46. However, the Most High does not dwell in the houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me? This is God talking, says the Lord. Or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all of these things? What does he say? He says, say, you can't capture me in the temple. He says, you can't capture me in the law. And he goes there and talks about what Moses said, verse 37. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up from you a prophet like me. This is Jesus from your brethren. And then he ends, they ends up saying, let me just summarize it for you. I know it's hard and confusing, and there are so many verses in between. He stood up and said, the land is not how you get right with God, his land. It's not the dirt. He's saying you don't even get right with God with the temple. You can't keep God there in the temple with all the exclusivity you have in Judaism. And he says you can't keep God in the law. He said not a one of you have kept the law. He said, law is going to save you? He said, you're in big trouble because nobody has kept the law. So he's refuted their two, accus- their two uh, uh, way they charged him, a few things of blasphemy. And now he's added the land. And then he begins to witness in such a magnificent way. Can't you see that glowing face there? I just uh, am overwhelmed by it. Verse 51, you men who are still stiff-necked and uncircumcised. In other words, they charged him, and now he comes back after them. He says, you men who are with stiff neck, you're prideful, you have a stiff neck. He said, you uncircumcised heart. He said, your heart is hard. He said, your ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit, for you are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets... Did your father speak to the Jews? Now listen, not persecute. Now, read the Old Testament. You've been reading the Old Testament. Read the, which one of those prophets did the Jews not persecute? Would you name one? They're listed. They have old books and a title. They rejected. They persecuted. They denied. denied they slandered. They killed some. He's, and, and here is Stephen telling it like it is, saying, okay, you religious leaders hear the highest thing. Which one of your prophets did you not persecute? And then he comes out and points out, he says, by the way, the ultimate prophet, you not only persecuted, you killed, which is Jesus of Nazareth. Whew. Can you imagine in that Supreme Court? <laughs> I love it. Verse 53, and you who received the law as ordained by angels, yet did not keep it. He's just brought it right home to them. They charged him with being blasphemous. And he says, you're all blasphemous. You've said the land is going to do it. Keep the law is going to do it. You've got this temple is going to do it. And you're going to see the big purpose of this in just about a New York minute. Look at the final place where he witnessed. Now, he's witnessed the synagogue, right? He's witnessed in the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court, Stephen. Now he goes and he witnesses why he's being stoned. Verse 54, now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and began gnashing their teeth at him, but being full of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something about the Holy Spirit. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can grieve only something that you love. The Holy Spirit loves you and loves me, 
And if Christ is in, in me, he has the beat of the spirit within you and within me. And we can grieve that spirit because the Holy Spirit loves us. You can grieve only somebody who loves you. And therefore, when we do not follow the Holy Spirit, we grieve the Holy Spirit. Also, as Christians, we can quench the Holy Spirit. We can drown out the Holy Spirit with our own life, our own activity, our own ego, and not hear that still, small voice. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. We can quench the Holy Spirit. But look in this verse what it says. He said they refuse the Holy Spirit. Only a non-Christian can do that. He's saying, y'all are not following God. You have not... They didn't grieve. They didn't quench. They'd refused. They'd rejected the Holy Spirit. That's what those outside of God in Christ do. Here's all the overwhelming evidence that's clear and plain and taught and explained ad infinitum, and still they refuse. Stephen said, that's what you guys have done. And so now, being full of the Holy Spirit, verse 55. He gazed intensely into the heavens and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Wait a minute. Read Hebrews chapter 8. Read all the way through the Bible. When Jesus ascended, what does it say about him? He's seated at the right hand of God. Every other place in the Bible, Jesus has gone into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of God. And here is Stephen, and now he is being stoned, and he looks up to heaven and now Jesus is standing. I wonder what that means. He is, G- he is seated, we know, because his finished work of salvation has been done. But now he's standing. I think he's standing to welcome the first martyr who gave their life for his cause to heaven. He's standing to welcome Stephen home. What a picture. I've got a little sidelight. I think when someone who's in Christ dies... I think those who are in Christ will have the same kind of reception that the heavens will open and we'll see the Father and Jesus will be standing to receive us unto himself, to welcome us home. That's what happened to Stephen. Look at the rest of it. It even gets richer if that's possible. But they cried out with a loud voice. (laughs) This is the Pharisees, the Sadducees and covered their ears, and rushed at him with impulse. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside the robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. That's our soon-to-be Paul. And they went on stoning Stephen, and he called on the Lord and said, by the way, this is a reminder of the death of Jesus, almost the same words. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Jesus said, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Isn't that terrific? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. We see the reflection of the martyrdom of Stephen, not unlike the substitution and atonement of Jesus Christ upon his death. What a word, ladies and gentlemen. What profound truth we have here. Now, what's this all about? Big picture. The Jews had been so exclusive and narrow in their worship of God in Judaism. Now, even the Jews who had seen that Jesus was Messiah, they kept the gospel right there in Jerusalem, right there in Judea and Galilee. It hadn't gone anywhere for 10 years. The exclusivity over here as Jews carried over to the Jews who received Christ, who were still a little nest of the temple, and they were still exclusive. The good news had still stayed in Jerusalem area for 10 years. What did that great commission say? When you receive power, They've received the power of the church. When you receive power, you shall be witnesses. And by the way, the word witness and the word martyr and the word martyr and the word witness in the Greek is exactly the same word. Interesting. Interesting. 
They'd receive power, but they'd use their power only among their Jews, only among the Jews. But now at the death of Stephen, if you read the rest of the book of Acts, the church exploded. All of a sudden, we have Cornelius, the centurion. He accepts Christ. He's not a Jew. We have the Ethiopian eunuch. He, he comes to Christ, and he's a non-Jew. We have Philip going down to Samaria. They were half Jews. The revival broke out in Samaria. And then you have, wait a minute, who's watching all this? What's that guy's name? Saul. And Saul goes and it says in the Bible, he's jerking Christians out of their home. Man, he's tearing up the church. And he did that in Jerusalem. And now he says, I hear some Christians are in Damascus and I'm going down there. I'm going to get them. And on the road to Damascus, ladies and gentlemen, we've heard all our life. Bang, lightning, flash. Suddenly, Saul meets the resurrected Jesus. And he is gloriously convinced I have a feeling, I have a feeling that as he saw Stephen martyred there and stoned, saw that face shine like an angel, that was preparation for him to understand and to understand when the resurrected Lord presented himself to him and he was gloriously converted. What happened with the conversion of of Saul, who became Paul, it opened up the gospel to the whole world. The death of Stephen. And now the heartbeat of the Holy Spirit moves out of Jerusalem, moves out of Judea, moves out of the Decapolis, moves out of Galilee. It moves all the way through Asia Minor, modern Turkey, and then Paul goes and crosses over into Europe and the Western world, the explosive good news of what God has done for man in Jesus Christ. That heartbeat of the Spirit just spreads over the globe. What happened? Stephen. Stephen, that's what exploded them. That's what awakened them. That's when they saw and read again and understood the Great Commission. Stephen. Heartbeat. Your heart beats. My heart's beating. It's good, isn't it? It's good to have a heart that beats. But it's awfully good to have a heart that's been born again. It'd be wonderful to have the beat of our hearts represented the beat of the Holy Spirit in you, the Spirit of Christ in you, and the Spirit of Christ in me, celebrating the fact that we have been born again. I want to show you the cutest birth announcement I have ever seen. There was a young woman in our church for many years, vivacious Christian, tremendous young lady. I mean, she loved the Lord Jesus Christ. She didn't get married for a long time. She met a guy who was a musician who lived in Nashville, of all things. And I don't know how many months, four or six months ago, they got married. She moved to Nashville. And they never thought they'd have a child. You know, she was too old, past the time she thought of childbearing, but shazam. After about, you know, three months of being married, she's pregnant. And so here he, she's married to a musician struggling in Nashville. And they go with the ultrasound and they hear the beat of the heart of the unborn baby. As a musician, he recorded the beat of the heart of the unborn baby. And they put together a little tune that he has written. And notice the beat of this tune is the heart of their unborn baby. And they use it as a birth announcement of the baby that is yet to come. Look at it. They say seasons can change in the blink of an eye. As for us, we've been blinking a lot. You'll recognize her, And many. it's out of our hands, but I know there's a plan, I admit. It's 
kind of crazy We're having a baby heartbeat of that unborn baby, speaking of a new birth to come, is the heartbeat of the Holy Spirit matched up with your heartbeat? If not, God wants it to be, because the heartbeat of the Holy Spirit reminds us that we can know the drummer who is Jesus Christ, who will take anybody here and make us brand new, born again.